Well, good evening and welcome to the Centre for Independent Studies. My name is Tom Switzer and I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. I just love those old ABC documentaries. And, and although the public broadcaster occasionally upsets people like us, I think it's fair to say the ABC on its day produces absolutely outstanding documentaries. That was from the Liberals in 1994. It was narrated by Prue Goward, who was then a senior ABC journalist. These days she's better known as a senior Liberal uh, minister in the New South Wales government. We've invited her tonight. She may well show up. Um, talking about those Liberal Party videos, my two favourite um, are um, the Howard years. They were done in 1998. And I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the Prime Minister, of, former Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. <clears throat> and my, my second favourite documentary is, um, was in the centenary year of the Federation in 2001. And uh, it was called A Hundred Years, The Australian Story. And that was narrated and primarily um, authored by another guest tonight, Paul Kelly. Now, CIS, as many of you know, is a public policy research organisation. We're primarily focused on promoting the principles of classical liberalism in areas such as economics and education and culture. But occasionally we do delve into current affairs and foreign affairs and even history. And that brings us to this evening. Uh, it should be stressed that my decision to um, invite Patrick Mullins, the author of this new book, and for us at CIS to launch this book was, <clears throat> to say the least, a very controversial one with the rank and file of CIS membership. Um, Neil Brown <clears throat> was among others who complained. Now, Neil Brown was a former Attorney General and communications minister in the Fraser government. Uh, he's better known these days as a spectator columnist. And he was one among many Liberal MPs in 1971 to support Bill McMahon in the leadership ballot against John Gorton. And Neil wrote to me uh, an email and he said, why on earth would CIS do an event on, of all people, Bill McMahon on the night of the 75th anniversary of the IPA when they're out hobnobbing on the Sydney Harbour. <laughs> and he went on to say, it's amazing to me that McMahon ever became Prime Minister. He was devoid of the most elementary qualities that the job requires. He had no judgment, no sense of occasion or timing, and not the slightest understanding of the mood of the people or their needs. Neil went on to say, McMahon was friendly enough, of course, and a great handshaker and backslapper. He would set upon complete strangers in King's Hall in the old Parliament House. McMahon would leap at these poor, unsuspecting people like, like a startled fawn and throw his arms around them as if they were long-lost friends. He did the same, of course, to his real friends and colleagues, but in these cases, there was an added eccentricity for he usually forgot their names. Indeed, McMahon struggled to hold on to office long after he had forgotten the names of almost everyone he dealt with, including myself. And I responded to Neil by saying that there were several good reasons why we should be launching a book on Bill McMahon. The first point is history. Uh, we all too often fail to put present day events in a broader historical context. And there's a case to be made, perhaps, that there are analogies to be drawn between the instability of the Liberal governments in the late 60s and early 70s with today. If you think about it, uh, from 1966 to 1972, we had six prime ministerships. Uh, Menzies, Holt, uh, McEwen, Gordon, McMahon and Whitlam. Uh, since 2010, we've also had six prime ministerships. Rudd, Gillard, Rudd again, Abbott, Turnbull, and, and uh, Morrison. Second, in the late 60s, McMahon and then the Country Party, the predecessor to the National Party, they fought some very important debates about trade protectionism and free trade. Now, we at CIS, back in the late 70s and throughout the 80s, helped uh, set the trends to liberalise trade and slash import tariffs. We're very proud of the role that we as an institute played in the economic reform agenda kick-started by the Hawke and Keating governments of 1983, supported at the time by John Howard in opposition and continued by John Howard 
throughout his 12 years in power. Uh, so that's an important part of this story today. And finally, I wanted to introduce you all to a young historian whom I rate very highly, uh, Patrick Mullins. Writing in the Australian Financial Review on Friday, Andrew Clark, who happens to be the son of the distinguished prominent historian Manning Clark, he wrote, Mullins displays a capacity to morph living and dead sources into a vivid scene. He manages to combine the skills and meticulous eye for details of the academic historian with the flair and know-how to spin a riveting yarn. Or yarns, really, because there are so many brilliantly painted pictures in Tiberius with a telephone. With that, please welcome Patrick Mullins. There's an old story about Billy McMahon that begins with him calling the Treasury and demanding that an urgent briefing be delivered to his home in Bellevue Hill. An official duly prepares the briefing, sets out for Dramalbin Road. And on his arrival, he's told that the Treasurer is in the pool. The official goes outside, sees that this is so, and makes to leave the briefing file on a chair. The Treasurer stops swimming for a moment, sits up, says, no, no, no. Read the briefing to me while I swim. <laughs> and then begins resuming, begins his swimming again. The tre this official, watching, paces the pool, reading this briefing file aloud to a man doubtlessly able to hear little but the rush and haul of water. Now, I doubt whether this story is actually true. <laughs> doubt very much. But... For the past four years as I've worked on this book on McMahon, um, that story stuck with me, largely because I felt very much like that official pacing the pool, writing, reading, talking about somebody who I feel is important, talking about something that I feel is important to an audience often unwilling or unable to listen. So it is very gratifying then to be invited here tonight to talk about Billy McMahon um, to talk about his role in this country's politics and its history, to talk about his eccentricities, his failings, his successes perhaps. So, after four years of pacing by the pool, I want to thank Tom and the Centre for Independent Studies for having me tonight. I want to thank Paul and Mr Howard for talking alongside me tonight. I appreciate it very much. As that story suggests though, McMahon has this reputation for eccentricity. We remember him as this kind of comic figure, a Walter Mitty-like figure. We remember him, as Jim Killen once said, as someone afflicted with Munchausen syndrome. He would tell stories, fantastic, about his great role in events. And hardly ever could they be reconciled with reality. <laughs> you know, we might think about this and, and think about how we understand McMahon in this, in this kind of lens. There's a story that's long entered, I think, into Liberal Party folklore of Bill Wakeling during the 1949 campaign. Standing in the builder's hut from which McMahon was running this campaign for the seat of Lowe, trying to change a light bulb. He slips from his chair, falls down on the ground, lays himself out. And McMahon, seeing through the window, thinks only of himself. Call Liberal Party headquarters. Tell them to send another organiser. Wakeling's dead. <laughs> My thought is that these stories are so colourful that they've crowded out the far more substantial part of McMahon's career. They've crowded out a better understanding of his role in this country's history, of his role in this country's politics. His image, his reputation has been steamrolled. He's a one-dimensional figure, someone we know in silhouette. There's more to him than this, much more to this man. If we view McMahon solely as a comic figure, then we overlook a significance that begins with him being an influential minister during the Suez Crisis, calling it right then. It overlooks his influence on state aid. It overlooks his influence on industrial relations and the waterfront. It overlooks a treasurer who's willing to, call, to question the regime of tariffs and protection, what Hancock called the faith and dogma of Australian politics, <laughs> 
it overlooks a foreign minister who orbit halted this country's path toward development of nuclear weapons. It overlooks a prime minister whose achievements include taking Australia into the OECD, legislating for Commonwealth involvement in childcare, the withdrawal of combat troops from Vietnam, the creation of the National Urban and Regional Development Authority. It includes a consideration of that Prime Minister's failings, his failure to engage with China amid fear of the DLP, his diminished authority in decisions over land rights for Australia's First Nations people, his attempts at politicking at tours of apartheid era sporting teams, and his desperate attempts to have survive ahead of the looming elections in 1972. Historian Tom Griffiths reminds us that history is essential to meaning and identity, and moreover that it is a powerful disciplinary tool in the search for truth. Its greatest virtue is its uncompromising complexity. The book that I've written, The House Brick, that will prop open any door, <laughs> the discussion tonight, that's what it's about, about trying to grapple with something complex and understand it. Thank you for coming tonight. It's been great to see you. I hope to hear some questions. Patrick, thank you very much. And now it's time for the conversation with uh, arguably Australia's most distinguished and, and experienced journalist and historian, Paul Kelly. Patrick, congratulations. This is a full picture of Billy McMahon a work of prodigious research, great detail, a tough-minded yet I think fair assessment, and I believe it captures not just Billy McMahon, but for me the great strength of the book is that it captures the entire era. Uh, many, many vivid characters, and it's such a critical time in Australian history. So I'd like to ask you, why did you choose Billy McMahon to write about? McMahon is the only Prime Minister of this country who has not, until now, been the subject of a biography. Frank Ford has attracted an honours thesis. He served for seven, eight days, I think. McMahon served for 21 months, hasn't been the subject of a biography until now. Moreover, McMahon's career, the length of it, uh, and his arguments and his significance in Australia's economic policy, I think, warranted a biographical study. There's also the fact that there's been no proper, thorough going through of the McMahon government. No kind of discussion, no attempt to grapple with why a minister with such extraordinary training, and McMahon had extraordinary training, nonetheless failed when he got to the top office. I wanted to answer that. I wanted to talk about the history that he was a player in. I wrote the biography. Now, you quote in the book, from David Bowman, the former editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, who was employed by, by Billy McMahon to work on the McMahon memoirs. So Bowman got to know McMahon very well and wrote, <coughs> McMahon really is a third-rate politician. He's really a rather nasty piece of work. Half-truths, lies, commo can, cheap attacks, what an unpleasant little turd. <laughs> what is the quality you most admire about <laughs> Billy McMahon? Thank you for that wonderful question, Paul. One of the things that I emerged from this book with uh, is a profound admiration for McMahon's persistence. This was, of course, the quality that Whitlam identified in his interviews with David Frost. And I think it's one that best explains McMahon. This is a man who could take humiliation upon humiliation, setback upon setback, uh, and yet nonetheless continued to strive, continued to push himself forward. There's something of a touch of Vidmapul to him. You know, he's comic, he's not taken seriously, he's viewed as a lightweight, viewed as a fop and yet somehow he continues to push ahead and he becomes a far more significant figure than other people would suggest and allow. I admired that. I thought that was important. I thought that was interesting. 
You admire his persistence, but one of the themes of the book is that McMahon was a disliked figure. He was disliked intensely by many of his colleagues and by many of the journalists to whom he leaked. So what I'd like to ask you is, given the years you've spent getting inside this man's head and personality, do you like McMahon yourself or not? Again, Paul, thank you for that wonderful question. <laughs> Uh, the liking and disliking of the figure, I think, is inimical to me as a biographer. I'm not there to like him. I'm not there to dislike him. I'm there to judge him. Uh, it doesn't matter, I think, what my personal feelings are. It's my judgments about him. I think he's an admirable figure for his persistence. I think he is a terrible figure if you want a paragon of morality and principle within politics at times. He was a complex man. He did act at times... Uh, I think, with good principle, with good intentions, with good ideas, with prescient ideas, but at other times he could be unscrupulous and ruthless. I don't admire that. I think what many people would say about McMahon, recognising the reality of political life, is that more than most political leaders, McMahon had serious character defects you think that's right? Yes, absolutely. Those defects were there early on as well. Uh, as relate in the book, one of McMahon's early promotions to the ministry in 1951 was the result of a ten this tendency to intrigue and to manipulate. After the 1951 elections, Menzies announced that he was going to appoint another minister to his cabinet and that he would announce the identity of that minister once enabling legislation had been passed. The gap between Menzies' announcement that he was going to appoint this minister and his announcement of the identity of that minister left a gap. Three Liberals went in secret to Eric Harrison, the senior Liberal Party uh, figure in New South Wales, and told him that Fred Osborne, for whom speculation had said that he was going to be the new minister, these three Liberals went to Harrison and said, Osborne does not enjoy our confidence. He is a martinet. He is arrogant. We don't want him. Don't have him. Menzies made the announcement. It was McMahon. It was at this point, Osborne, having been told, having heard repeatedly, having had it floated repeatedly in the press that he was going to be the man appointed, now heard of this deputation that had weighed on Harrison. He went to Harrison, asked if it was true. Harrison said yes. Osborne said to him, was Billy McMahon among the delegation that weighed on you? Harrison said yes. This rent an irrevocable wound on Osborne. He said later that he had gone into politics confident, ebullient, um, idealistic as well, but that this moment changed it. He had been friendly with McMahon. They were lawyers from neighbouring Sydney seats. McMahon had even driven Osborne down to Canberra before the House sat in 1950 so they could figure out where they were going to sit in the House chamber. This changed all that. That was a betrayal of all that. A journalist later told Osborne that it's not unusual in politics to walk around with your throat cut or to have your throat cut. But what was unforgivable was to be allowed to walk around for three weeks not knowing that your throat had been cut. An act of treachery. And you've introduced a very interesting subject, the relationship between Menzies and McMahon. There's a wonderful story in the book about how Menzies captures McMahon leaking and forces a confession from McMahon that he then keeps in his drawer or in his files. Tell us the story. So, as Paul's pretty much related most of it, actually. <laughs> oh no, there's a lot more. <laughs> Menzies had his secretary come in and have and dictated to her the record of this meeting where McMahon said, yes, I had shown this cabinet submission um, to a, a, fed, a fellow MP. The secretary took it out, gave Menzies the paper, said, is this correct? Menzies pushed it toward McMahon and McMahon said, oh, there's a couple of errors. Menzies <coughs> said, right, well, change it, fix it, make it accurate, sign it. This paper is still available. You can go get it. It's in the National Archives. <laughs> 
McMahon's annotations are there in lead pencil. He doesn't deny the substantive parts of the meeting. He leaked this cabinet file. Menzies folded it up, signed it, said to be used if McMahon ever again leaks. And it is a perplexing question why Menzies never used it. And of course, other senior ministers are aware that Menzies had this ammunition against McMahon would from time to time lament the fact that Menzies had never used this as a weapon to finish McMahon's career. Menzies, uh, later on uh, in his uh, life, said of McMahon, to me, he is a contemptible little squirt. <laughs> McMahon, I think, is the most characterless man who was ever Prime Minister of Australia, a dreadful little man. But I quote that because there's a paradox here. Menzies says that of McMahon, and yet Menzies as Prime Minister keeps promoting McMahon from one ministry to another. Is this a paradox, and what's the explanation for it? <laughs> it is something of a paradox. It is. It's a, a mystery in some respects. There are some explanations for it. After the 1951 election, uh, McMahon, sorry, after the 1954 election, McMahon was seemed ready for the drop. He's, people thought he was going to get the kick. Uh, the journalist Harold Cox talked about this with John McEwen, and McEwen said, no, I think highly of McMahon. If I had to leave my job, McMahon, after Menzies, would be the next best person for it. It was at McEwen's insistence that McMahon was appointed Minister for Primary Industries in 1956 it was at McEwen's insistence that McMahon was moved out of primary industries in 1958. Uh, so there's one hand, there's the McEwen's lobbying. There's also, however, McMahon's connections, his strengths. He was obviously close with Sir Frank Packer. He was obviously close with Sydney's business community. McMahon was also quite an industrious minister. He was hardworking and he had an expertise in economics. All of those reasons, I think, are among why Menzies kept him around. I should uh, point out, among the many great uh, nuggets in the book, is McMahon's claim on one occasion that Dame Patty Menzies said that uh, McMahon should uh, have certainly married her daughter. <laughs> How good a minister was Billy McMahon? In most respects, quite a good minister. McMahon, as I said before, was quite industrious. He worked hard. He worked long hours. This was a man, in some respects, who lived for politics. He would master his brief, much like a lawyer does. He would use the strengths of his department. He was quite a good minister. He was able to argue his corner. He was able to argue his case. The criticism of McMahon comes, I think, to some, to some extent, uh, from his perhaps not willingness to reform or to do things that his public service departments didn't want him to do. Uh, McMahon was, I think, at his best when he was doing what his department wanted, when the two were aligned. In Treasury, for example, I think that's where it comes out most of all, most strongly of all. Your book gives a very full and fascinating account of one of the most titanic rivalries in the history of Australian politics between Sir John McEwen as Trade Minister and Billy McMahon as treasurer. And what it brings out is the absolute ruthlessness and the, the personal nature of this conflict between the two men. <coughs> it's almost as though uh, any particular uh, tactic was to be resorted to in terms of this battle. So how do you judge McMahon in terms of this battle with McEwen, in terms of the way he conducted the battle and the final result? To some extent, this is probably McMahon's shining hour. McMahon, promoted to the Treasury in 1966 after the retirement of Menzies, begins to argue against the protectionist regime that McEwen had been intent on pursuing for so long, started to push back on it constantly. In many respects, there was no upside for McMahon in doing this. Liberals everywhere were scared of McEwen. Bert Kelly later said that McEwen could clobber the hell out of you if he wanted, and the Liberals were right scared of him. And that's true. 
McMahon was one of the first people who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with McEwen. And I think that point is entirely to his credit. His methods, not so much. McMahon leaked relentlessly. Maxwell Newton was enlisted as an ally for McMahon right throughout this period. McMahon uh, developed the Australian Resources Development Bank as an alternate proposal to head off McEwen's proposal for an Australian Industry Development Corporation. Try to come up with his own way of rendering that measure moot. So this was a scurrilous battle in some respects. It was waged in the press, it was waged through the bureaucracy, but nonetheless it was to McMahon's credit. In Cabinet they were arguing, they were going toe to toe, and McMahon was forcing a change, I think. Your book provides a brilliant account of this extraordinary interregnum in Australian politics <coughs> between the retirement of Menzies in January 1966 and Whitlam's victory in December 1972, uh, when we have uh, Holt, Gorton and McMahon as successive prime ministers. After Holt's drowning, of course, McEwen becomes acting prime minister and vetoes McMahon as the new leader of the Liberal Party, as someone that the country party will not serve under. This is, this is a brilliant chapter. McMahon is humiliated, he's trashed. It's a wonder that he survives as, uh, as treasurer, but he does survive. And I think one of the morals from this is that McMahon is a tremendous survivor. What's your, what's your particular take on the drama of those events and what it tells us about Billy McMahon? I, I see these, these are astonishing events, absolutely astonishing. Unprece no, not unprecedented, I'm sorry, uh, not unprecedented. It is worth saying that McEwen had learned from the past. <laughs> Earl Page dis managed to dislodge Billy Hughes doing this. Earl Page tried to forestall Menzies coming to power through this. He failed that time. McEwen was there, he saw that. He knew what mistakes were made. <coughs> McEwen followed through, got his way. He stopped McMahon becoming Prime Minister. This was, I think, a pivotal moment, an unprecedentedly interesting moment, and for McMahon, perhaps the most severe setback of his career. The fact that he was nonetheless able, simultaneously, to scupper moves to displace him as treasurer, scupper moves to displace him as the deputy party leader, uh, and in fact at the same time to provoke sympathy for him. Now most of the Liberal Party didn't like McMahon very much. It's a matter of conjecture of course, but if McMahon had been able to stand in that le election for the leadership, he would have lost, I think. I think he would have lost. So the fact that he managed to parlay this into something of a victory to a moment where survival was its own victory is a huge testament to his ability to endure, to survive. And Paul Hasluck, when he wrote to Menzies to explain that loss in, in that ballot, he was, I mean, shaken. He said he realised with a wry sort of way that this man, this little man, is far more formidable a figure than I'd have allowed myself to believe. Well, I might just interrupt and quote what Hasluck said of McMahon at the time. I think he is in a stronger position than he was the day before Harold died. McMahon is now seen as a more clever man than I thought he was, although my distrust of him is greater than ever, and my contempt for his political methods is profound. So that's Hasluck commenting on McMahon the survivor after Gorton defeats Hasluck and becomes Prime Minister. How long before McMahon began to turn against Gorton? What we think would have been measured in the span of minutes, perhaps. <laughs> There's no denying that McMahon was almost instantly rebuffed uh, and it took a long time for him to find his feet again, to find um, the kind of confidence and garrulousness that he normally carried on with. Um, but it was very soon after, the, after Gorton's election that he realised he needed again to draw on those capacities to survive. Early in Gorton's tenure, Gorton canvassed getting rid of McMahon, sacking him. 
um, and repeatedly followed through with methods to humiliate McMahon to some extent. His intervention in the MLC matter, for mm. example, is a really telling part of that. McMahon wasn't around when the decision was made. He was in Zurich. He took a phone call in a train station telling him that Gorton had overturned his own policy. And yet when he returned to Australia, McMahon was the one made to sign the policy. He, another humiliation visited upon him. But all too soon, he was turning around. He was working to undermine Gorton. He was working to salvage his position, to undo what he thought was wrong of Gorton, working again to advance his own interests. Consider the list of great figures or substantial figures from the time who had <coughs> no truck with McMahon. Menzies, Gorton, McEwen, Hasluck, Doug Anthony. Yet McMahon prevails and eventually becomes Prime Minister. How does this happen? Partly through his own work, partly through the fault, through, through the work of allies, partly through the faults of others. When McMahon became Prime Minister in 1971, it wasn't because he had launched a leadership challenge. It was because the Liberal Party itself at that point had imploded. Gorton had, and, and Malcolm Fraser had become locked in a small battle uh, that unwittingly caused Gorton's downfall. McMahon managed to prevail at this point in a really quite curious decision. Half the party did not want him. Half the party wanted Gorton. And somehow, through the circumstances of the party ballot, Gorton was gone. And the man that nobody really wanted was there. I mean, the choice at that point was McMahon and Billy Snedden. Sophie's choice, to some extent, in that ballot. <coughs> so isn't the real conclusion here that the explanation lies in Gorton's ineptitude, Gorton's failures as a prime minister, and the fact that once they were established, McMahon was the alternative? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely the case. Could McMahon have become prime minister without Frank Packer and Alan Reid? Alan Reid? No, absolutely not. Alan Reid uh, and the support of Frank Packer were instrumental in McMahon's rise. They had been early allies, so were long-time allies. McMahon had invested in Sydney Newspapers Limited, which, as you'll be all be aware, undergirded um, Frank Packer's, Sir Frank Packer's wealth. With Reid, McMahon cultivated him, used him to establish his reputation to sell him as a well-performing minister, as a reforming minister for external affairs, without the support, without those allies, no, McMahon would not have had a hope. Was his prime ministership doomed from the start in the sense that Whitlam was always going to win the 1972 election? Was there anything McMahon could have done that might have reversed that result? I don't agree that Whitlam, that that election outcome was settled. Um, we have to recall the closeness of the 1972 election and set aside this kind of mythos that's accreted to Whitlam where he just coasted to victory. There was a chance that the Liberal Party could win that 1972 election. During 1971, that is the first year of McMahon's prime ministership, there were suggestions that McMahon had managed to get the Liberal Party back into a position from which it could win. It's worth saying. McMahon as prime minister worked to try and counter the advantages that Labor had established over the Liberal Party, most notably in urban and regional affairs. Uh, but at the same time, he was furiously trying to stay afloat on a ship that was sinking. The Liberals, I think, had a chance to win the election. They didn't. That's due to McMahon's failures. That's due to the failures of his own party. Um, that is also due to, the, to other problems as well. The withdrawal of support, for example, by the Tally Telegraph when Frank Packer sold it to Rupert Murdoch. We'll get to that. <laughs> what are his achievements as Prime Minister? The two or three main achievements of Billy McMahon as Prime Minister? First one, I think, is 
McMahon's withdrawal of combat troops from Vietnam. Vietnam had become a, a, a millstone around the Liberal Party's neck. Um, McMahon had opposed, at first, the commitment of Australian troops to Vietnam in 1964. He had voiced hesitancies and doubts about it. In 1971, at the end of 1971, he had acted to bring home the combat troops. That's a one big success, I think. The second has to be the Commonwealth leg legislation for involvement in childcare. That transformed what was until then a quasi-private industry into a public one. It paved the way for the professionalisation of that industry, for greater education, for greater learning, for research in it. I think that's an achievement of it. Another is McMahon's work to catch up the policy advantages that Labor enjoyed in urban and regional affairs. McMahon established the National Urban and Regional Development Authority in 1972, run out of the Prime Minister's department, which Whitlam took and rebadged the City's Commission when he took office. Some of those successes are enduring, some of those successes were built over. But I think they are successes of his administration. One of the things we've learnt over the years is the very substantial difference between being a successful senior minister on one hand and being a successful and competent prime minister on the other. Do you think that Billy McMahon was out of his depth as prime minister? Yes. Yes. To a large extent, yes. Why? Partly McMahon refused to delegate. He couldn't trust people. And having worked a lifetime to undermine people, that's quite fair. <laughs> he also, though, was, I think, relying too heavily on a department that could not do what he wanted it to do. He was, I think, unable to draw on the best talents of his team. I think he was unable to articulate a contemporary but enduring image for the Liberal Party in the lead up to that election. Yes, he was out of his depth. And to what extent was his visit to the United States for talks with President Nixon when Billy McMahon and Sonia uh, went to the United States uh, and dined with Nixon uh, and we had um, we had the talks between Nixon and McMahon with all the fiasco that that involved. To what extent does that trip to the United States highlight the point that McMahon was out of his depth? And what are the examples that illustrate that from the trip? So, one of the big places where McMahon being out of his depth is best illustrated. Uh, which journalists repeatedly who are observing this trip and which historians have returned to over and over again is this image of McMahon going up the steps into the White House followed by his wife Sonia in that dress. <laughs> and during the course of this state dinner with Nixon, talking about how he had wooed Sonia by singing to her. <laughs> now one of McMahon's staffers said to me that, well, this was a, contempt this was a convivial occasion Everyone was having fun. There was a good drink on the table. It was a great night. A formal speech would not have gone over well, wouldn't have done it. I disagree profoundly. That speech, that, that night, exposed, I think, McMahon's shallowness to some extent, his inability to understand the weight of the occasion, and his... You know, this kind of centrality, this, this is about me, this is about this moment, this is about this wonderful place that I'm in. You know, I mean, Mc, he was meeting with Nixon and Nixon was asking him, how do you pronounce your name? Is it McMahon? McMahon? McMahon. What is it? If you could have an occasion where <coughs> the lack of substance was better shown, I haven't seen it. No. Doesn't the fact that McMahon became leader of the Liberal Party and Prime Minister, given what you've just said, highlight the lack of senior talent in the party at that time? To some extent, yes. To some extent, yes. But we have to recall that less than three years later, the Liberals were back in government. Malcolm Fraser had led the party back into government. There was still, I think, 
men of caliber within that party at that time. But the division and disunity, the poison that had been engendered within the party, uh, was tainting some of those figures to too great an extent. I want to put to you a theory about McMahon because it seems to me that McMahon in many ways is a tragic figure who gets caught out of time. McMahon's a 49er. He comes into the parliament in 1949, just a few years after World War II, and yet here he is as prime minister in the early 1970s. It's a different world and all the established pillars are collapsing. He can no longer be certain about suspicion of China, no longer certain about the rightness of the Vietnam War, no longer certain about the reliability of the United States, and above all, no longer certain about the Daily Telegraph, <laughs> given that Frank Packer sold the Telegraph to Rupert Murdoch and Richard Farmer, my old mate, is firing bullets in the Telegraph against Billy McMahon. So the world that McMahon knew has changed and all the established certitudes that he lived by are gone. And in that sense, he's caught out of time. Absolutely. And we have to add to that as well the issue of state aid. Menzies had managed to win government uh, and, and to win the allegiance of a certain sector of the vote because of his willingness to extend government aid to Catholic schools, to independent schools. 1972 election campaign, of course, Archbishop James Carroll came out and all but said that the policies between the two parties now are so indistinguishable that you should be able to vote for whoever you feel. They're both the same. The withdrawal of those pillars was absolutely devastating for McMahon. Yet the, British, the British historian Anthony Selden identified nine common factors to the loss of government for conservative parties in the United Kingdom. All of those were in play when McMahon was Prime Minister. There was a negative image of McMahon within the electorate. Confidence in the Liberal Party's capacities for economic management was shot. The party was manifestly disunited. The party was confused over policy. There was a rejuvenated opposition. There was a clear mood for change within the electorate. The party was depleted financially. In organisational terms, it was in some disarray. These were issues. These were big problems. And yet, McMahon was grappling with them. Yet, as you pointed out in your opening remarks, the magnitude of Whitlam's victory in 1972 is very narrow. It's very tight. This is not a sweeping victory. This is nothing like a landslide. So while the Labor campaign is based on the idea it's time, it's time for the country to fundamentally change and transform, it's actually a very modest victory. Why is the victory so modest? I think in large part it's due to McMahon's capacity to work and to catch up on some issues. McMahon was able, to some extent, admittedly to a failing extent, failed at it, he was able to establish certain and rectify certain weaknesses within the Liberal Party. He was able to quell the infighting between the state premiers, the Liberal state premiers and the federal government. Clashes between Gorton and Askin had been nearly monthly before him. By the time McMahon was in office, Balti, Askin, they were gone. Sorry, Askin was still there. These were, you know, I think in large part, McMahon was able to right the ship to some extent. Sinking, perhaps still on the right course though. Just a couple of issues to finish on. One of the ironic aspects of McMahon's political career is that I don't think any senior politician leaked so often <laughs> to journalists, yet inspired such contempt from the journalists he leaked to. <laughs> How do you explain that? Uh, largely because McMahon's leaking was so self-evidently self self-serving. There was, there's, a, there's an instance where McMahon, standing ne next to a, at a urinal with Graham Perkin, when Perkin was a cadet reporter, giving him a leak, 
And, <laughs> and the next day, when he saw Menzies ticking off Perkin about this, joining in and saying, that was a disgraceful story, you shouldn't have run that. <laughs> He, he was tremendously self-serving. Uh, and, and with journalists, that was transparent. They could see that. They knew that, that McMahon was always ready for a good leak. Uh, and that was something he carried right through his career, right through his career. Barry Jones talked about it when McMahon died. He said that when McMahon was in the parliament, he'd call up and say, have you seen page two of The Age? It's outrageous what Malcolm Fraser has done. In question time, why didn't you ask him about this? <laughs> McMahon couldn't stop talking, couldn't stop gossiping. Uh, and he was often and almost always doing this with his own interests at heart. There's a very good anecdote you recount um, from the Sydney Morning Herald journalist Angus McLaughlin. Uh, seeking to cultivate uh, the journalist Angus McLaughlin, you write, McMahon promised to support anything the Herald might want in Cabinet. McLaughlin was outraged. How can you respect a man like that, he said. Classic example of the journalist having a contempt for the politician. So at the end of his career, McMahon had great trouble because he couldn't write a book. Tell us about that. When McMahon retired from the parliament, he knew that his reputation was shot. He knew that people were beginning to damn him. He knew, I think he foresaw that his reputation would be that he was Australia's worst prime minister. And he became set upon transforming that with a book, with a memoir, with an autobiography. He saw this as being a huge historical epic. He saw it as being serious. He saw it as being scholarly. He saw it as telling a grand story of his role in events, what he had done, how he had succeeded, how everyone was wrong. And that's what he promised he would do. He didn't have the capacity to do it. From 1982 until 1988, McMahon churned through an industry of ghostwriters, journalists, academics, Mark Latham, apparently even, <laughs> trying to write this book. Never happened. McMahon could not reconcile his faults and failings. He couldn't identify them. He couldn't stitch together a story that took the reader into the past, that sought to understand. He didn't demonstrate, couldn't demonstrate, that degree of reflection that would be required for a convincing, credible, autobiographical account. The chapters in this book that inter are interwoven with McMahon's life talk about this. They talk about the constant divergence between McMahon's recollections and the documentary record. They talk about McMahon's constant willingness to puff himself up when the documentary record said otherwise. There was never a set text. There was never a finished draft. McMahon laboured on it for years. He compiled a huge number of files, a huge number of files. Never got it finished, never got it published. Died with it, still in the cabinets. Back to you, Tom. <clears throat> well. Paul, thank you, and thank you, Patrick, and uh, I hope you all enjoyed that discussion as much as I did. I thought that was absolutely outstanding, sound in style and substance, so thank you both very much. In organising this event, um, I consulted three living Australians who knew Bill McMahon reasonably well. Uh, the first was uh, Lennox Hewitt, who was a very senior public servant in the Commonwealth in the late 60s and early 1970s, well, for many years, but particularly during the Gordon McMahon years. Uh, but to Sir Lennox is a, um, he's now 101, he's in a nursing home in Sydney, so he could not be here with us this evening, but he does pass on his regrets. I also asked uh, Bill Hayden, who of course is a former Labor leader, a treasurer, a foreign minister and governor general. Um, he is living in Queensland, he's now in his late 80s, early 90s, he's unable to make it this evening, but again, he sends his regrets. But the third living Australian <laughs> who uh, knew Bill McMahon very well, um, was, of course, uh, our nation's second longest serving Prime Minister. Uh, John Howard served with Bill McMahon in Parliament from 1974 to 1982, and he knew Bill McMahon uh, beforehand, most notably during the 1972 election. For his reflections, please welcome John Howard.
<laughs> well, thank you. Um, uh, Tom, uh, thank you very much for those kind remarks. Um, can I just say that, um, Patrick, you've done a great service to political history in writing this book. Um, whatever people thought about Billy McMahon, about his character, about his behaviour, about his loyalties, he was a substantial figure in Australian politics from 1949 until uh, his defeat as Prime Minister in 1972. I have a few observations to make about some of the paradoxes that were raised during your interrogation, a masterly <laughs> interrogation by Paul Kelly. <clears throat> I think the explanation for Menzies' toleration of McMahon uh, was no more substantial than the desire of Menzies to placate liberal sentiment in New South Wales. Menzies was always conscious that in the period between 1946 and 1949 that the intonation that you can't win with Menzies was much stronger in Sydney than it was in other parts of the country. And you've got to remember that <coughs> in night from the time we were returned to power in 1949, really the the towering figure until 1956 of the Liberal Party was the member for Wentworth, Eric Harrison. And when Harrison went, <coughs> there was removed an enormously influential figure. Because remember, Harrison was the only senior Liberal figure in 1941 who stayed loyal to Menzies when he was pushed out effectively as leader of the UAP. So I think Menzies was always a bit sensitive and, and nobody had emerged. I mean, Barwick had come into Parliament in 1958 and was seen as a possible replacement, but then he decided to go to the High Court in 1964. So I think that is a, a, a possible explanation. You have dealt extensively with <coughs> the mistrust that people had towards McMahon, and I, I don't have a lot to add to that except to recall a conversation I had with Malcolm Fraser um, when I was compiling my book on the Menzies years. And I said to Fraser, when you made your rather uh, well-remembered resignation speech in uh, March of, of 1971, which effectively brought Gorton down and was centred around the dispute invo involving the uh, Army's performance in Vietnam and... Uh, uh, the the personnel, personality clash between uh, Gorton and uh, McMahon, uh, you must have realised that if you removed Gorton as leader, there was only one possible replacement, and, uh, and that was McMahon. And you've just told me that nobody trusted him, and he had. Why did you nonetheless feel it necessary to remove Gorton. He said, well, John, sometimes things get to a stage where you feel that somebody has to be removed irrespective of the consequences as far as a replacement was concerned. Now, to me, it was a very interesting response uh, because what in effect he was saying was he had thought the man he helped elevate to the prime ministership after hot ground had be become so inept uh, at handling the job that he had to be removed irrespective of the consequences. So notwithstanding the fact that he had told me how people intensely mistrusted McMahon. Can I say a couple of things about his performance as a minister? Um, I think there are two contributions he made in very difficult situations that should be mentioned, and these in non-Treasury portfolios. I thought the work he did in establishing the stevedoring industry authority as a separate uh, agency for the recruitment of waterfront labour uh, made a very important contribution. And as you know, in uh, later years when we were in government, uh, I was quite interested in waterfront reform. <laughs> <coughs> I remember it well. <laughs> and. Uh, as a result, I, I took quite a keen interest and I thought McMahon's uh, 
handling of that was astute and did make a contribution to a major reform. And I think it should also be remembered, unless my memory is failing me, um, that um, when he was Minister for Labor, he was also Minister for National Service and that he was therefore responsible for administering the National Service Act at the time of the Vietnam War. And of course, that was an extremely um, difficult and, and controversial responsibility. Uh, some people have argued that Iman was the first dry uh, in the Liberal Party. Um, uh, I've got an open mind on that, but there's no doubt that the arguments he mounted in relation to tariff protection and government intervention in the economy uh, by and large accorded with uh, uh, what later was called the gathering of dries in the Liberal Party. There's justifiable emphasis in your intercession with Paul Kelly about the narrowness of Labor's victory in 1972, and that does have to be uh, emphasised. In fairness to the Labor Party, we should remember that most of the swing was achieved in 1969. And remember, uh, Hull had a massive victory over uh, Colwell, and then there was a very big movement at Whitlam's first election in 1969, and uh, Whitlam got the necessary additional seats. But why was this so? Um, I think one of the reasons that it was so was that the world and Australia was still living albeit in the twilight of, the, of that great assumption that interve an, an interventionist economy worked well. I mean, unemployment in 1972 was about one and a half percent. 1.4. It was astonishing. Uh, uh, 1.4. And, I mean, you know, there was a, the Labor Party was alleging there was a crisis because one month's figures went up to about 2 percent. Now, this was really the twilight of that period and of course it was the misfortune, if I can put it that way, I, I don't think I'm being over generous to my uh, political opponents in saying it was the misfortune of, of, of the Labor Party after 1972 to really cop the changes that were brought about by, by the oil shock and the, uh, the breaking down of the Bretton Woods uh, fixed exchange rate mechanisms etc. So, I, I think that is um, an explanation. Could I just say one other thing about uh, uh, Bill McMahon, that um, I mean, his um, personal foibles have been highlighted and have made, been made the subject of a lot of criticism, and I don't, you know, I don't seek to, to dispute that. I was not uh, a parliamentary colleague of his in the sense of being, uh, I entered parliament after he'd been Prime Minister and I interacted with him as best I can, although I should say that there were a small number of people, and I think I mentioned this to you in the interview, that when I uh, was suddenly uh, confronted with the prospect that late in 1977 of becoming Treasurer, there were some people in the Sydney business community who argued that, to Malcolm Fraser that uh, Bill McMahon should be made Treasurer. Uh, and you know, I understood that because he'd been, and he had a reputation then of having been a successful treasurer. Because when you preside over an economy that works pretty well, um, you you do get a lot of the credit. But um, I uh, was, as <coughs> Tom mentioned, uh, asked by the Liberal Party uh, to uh, take a couple of months off from my practice in 1972. Uh, to travel around with Bill McMahon during the election campaign. Um, can I say, having observed him at very close range, that um, he, he, he kept trying. He didn't, act, he didn't in any sense fall apart in that campaign. Uh, the weaknesses that he had continued to be revealed. He did not appear to me to have close colleagues in the Cabinet which is a terrible drawback, being a, having been a Prime Minister myself. You try and have good relations with all of your colleagues, but there are some that you have particularly good relationships with. And I think it was a pity that he didn't have a better relationship with the senior people in the National Party, because they were the, really the strong men and the experienced uh, survivors of some of the earlier years, and he, he didn't have particularly good <laughs> 
But he conducted himself, I, I felt, with dignity. I was actually at his home in DeMalvin Road in Bellevue Hill on the night of the election. And uh, he conducted himself in that very uh, historic moment because it marked the end of 23 years uh, of uh, Liberal Party government. And he conducted himself with dignity. Um, I remember that night well because after it was over, my wife and I repaired to the home of the then president of the Liberal Party, John Atwell, and to, how shall I put it, drown our sorrows. And we, <laughs> we, we reminisced about things and uh, I must say we never realised that within three years' time uh, the coalition would be back in government, but that belongs to another piece of analysis. I don't really disagree with the fundamental conclusions in your book, I think it, it, is a, it is a very, very fine piece of writing. It really is, and it does fill a gap that uh, needed to be filled. I'm no um, uh, great um, you know, psychologist, but I think Bill McMahon exhibited a lot of the characteristics in life of somebody who had a wretchedly lonely childhood. And uh, I think that is one of the explanations that you allude to. And I think it is part of the difficulty that he had. But he did make an impact. Uh, he did administer portfolios across a huge range. Uh, he came to the prime ministership in very unusual circumstances. People often do. Uh, but his, <laughs> uh, but his, uh, his certainly were very unusual. And uh, I thank you for uh, contributing to a better understanding uh, uh, of a significant figure in our political history. Thank you. Sit down there, mate. No, listen, just sit down there, Paul, Patrick. We've got time for one, maybe two quick questions because we are running out of time. Uh, questions to Paul Kelly, Patrick Mullins and John Howard. A first question, yes sir. Uh, just wait for a mic, do we have a mic, a roving mic? If not, speak loudly. You're right, mate. Um, in the book, you say that uh, in 1969... Um, Here you go, mate. Sorry. Sorry? Here's your mic. Yes. In the book, you say that in 1969, McEwen lifted the embargo on McMahon being Prime Minister. Um, was it for reasons similar to those given by Mr Howard in his uh, interview with Malcolm Fraser, namely that... By 1969, uh, McEwen believed that for all of McMahon's faults, um, Gorton had to be gotten rid of. In other words, that for all of McMahon's faults, Gorton was worse. McEwen always said that his decision to lift that veto was one of two things. One was his problems with Gorton. And in fact, when he met with Paul Hasselak, the Governor-General, after that election and after the leadership had been settled, he spoke with considerable force about the difficulties he had had with McEwen. Um, so that's one point. The other one is that McEwen also felt that he had perhaps been mistaken to veto McMahon back after Harold Holt had drowned. He thought and questioned whether or not, at that point, McMahon would have been, you know, would have come up short in that ballot. He also suggested that McMahon was one of the most experienced Liberal Party MPs at that point and that it was perhaps poor form to continue to deny him or to continue to deny the Liberal Party that opportunity. Next question, sir. Thank you, Patrick, for a most erudite presentation of a work. I don't think I can recall the previous book launch where someone's been so articulate about this subject. My question is about Lord Casey's role with the Holt, McEwen, um, McMahon situation <coughs> and whether or not in the vernacular he overstepped the mark and whether we would expect a Governor General to behave like that in today's environment. <laughs> that was to me? Or <laughs> when we do both, you go first. Oh, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, you go oh, first quickly. I think we should hear from you as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I think that Casey did overstep the mark. I think that he did. Uh, it was, I think, inappropriate for him to try to arbitrate a dispute between McMahon and McEwen. Um, and I think it is, in some respects, Holt's failing, in fact, 
to not uh, use his authority to quell that dispute and to say that enough was enough. Um, I think Casey did overstep the mark there, yes. John Howard. Well, look, I, I, I completely agree with that. I, th I mean, it would be unthinkable, my experience for a Governor General in the time I was there to have involved himself. I think he demonstrated on that occasion that he had not made the, the transition that McKell succeeded in making, and um, um, I think to, um, to his uh, credit, Hasluck succeeded in making. And, but also, Patrick's second point is even more powerful. It was a halt failure. And if you've got two ministers who are brawling, it's the Prime Minister's responsibility to bang their heads together or, or get rid of both or one or whatever. But you don't drag the Governor-General into it or allow the Governor-General to, to inject himself, which I think is what happened. I don't think Casey could leave it alone. Paul, you want to say anything? Yeah, Paul Kelly. I just want to clarify whether your question is about Casey's intervention with McEwen and McMahon or whether the question is about Casey's decision after Holt drowns to commission McEwen as Prime Minister. They're completely different things. They are, but it was really about the former. The but former. You could answer the latter. <laughs> well, well, I think the I think the form has been dealt with um, mm. uh, by um, yeah. by Patrick and Mr. Howard. The latter is absolutely fascinating issue. Um, I think it's understandable. I mean, Casey was a player. There's no doubt. I think it's understandable what Casey did to commission McEwen, because McEwen was vetoing. McMahon. Imagine if he'd commissioned McMahon. The political consequences would have been uh, somewhat uh, catastrophic, I think. Final well, I think question. Can I just say yeah. on that right. it's an interesting subject. I, um, I think, having been critical of Casey in relation to the, you know, the generic McMahon uh, McEwen argument, I think Casey was absolutely right as Paul said, to commission uh, McEwen, because McEwen was the deputy prime minister. He was the leader uh, of the party that could not deliver the prime ministership uh, in, 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 in a positive sense. And you had the, um, the precedent of Page to draw upon. Uh, I mean, you, you forget Page's appalling attempt to denigrate Menzies. That's a separate issue also. But the, the precedent of commissioning Page was absolutely instructive and I, I thought on that score he and and uh, it was the perfectly sensible thing to do. Final question to my colleague uh, Simon Cowan who's head of our research at uh, the Centre for Independent Studies. Simon. Excellent thank you Tom and gentlemen excellent talk this evening. I want to try and bring us back to modern politics. In Tom's opening he made the comparison between the uncertainty and the instability that occurred at the end of the Liberal government in the <coughs> 70s uh, to the instability and uncertainty we see today. What's your take on that comparison? What lessons do you think we can draw from that period? Uh, and do you think that there is, is a valid comparison to be drawn there and, and lessons that we could learn from that instability and how that then played out in subsequent years? Mm. I think that's for you. John Howard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I, I, I beg to disagree with Tom. I think one of the big differences is that um, the Labor Party in 1972 had an infinitely more impressive alternative <laughs> Prime Minister. But you might well say I'll say that. But uh, I mean, I actually do. I think he was. A, I think one of the great strengths the Labor Party had at the time was they did have a leader who was seen uh, as being of substance and uh, of being in touch with. Uh, a new view of things to the extent that that was around at the time. Look, there are, there are always comparisons that can be drawn. Um, I don't think that um, the it's time factor is relevant at all at the present time. Mm. But it really isn't. I mean, if there's, if there's one, there, you know, I think there are a number of reasons why coalition supporters <coughs> should remain hopeful about the next election. And one of them is there is no it's time factor. And there was an it's time factor overwhelmingly in 72. There was, to a much reduced extent, an it's time factor when, when I lost to Kevin Rudd. Uh, 
Uh, but after all, we've been in power for only five years, and that is not an its time factor. And I, so therefore, I think, Tom, you're, you're overeating. Yeah. Okay, well, on that note, Paul cake. Kelly, are there, are there leadership, uh, this instability uh, and the broader divisions <laughs> yeah. within the broader com conservative movement, do you see Look, analogies with today? Yeah, no, no, I'm asking Paul, because <laughs> he'll back this argument. Go, Paul. I think there are quite interesting parallels, and I think you get insights from looking at the two periods. So in the earlier period, we see a change of Prime Minister from Holt to Gorton to McMahon. We see the Liberal Party profoundly divided, divided over personalities, unable to unify, unable to present a unified portrait of itself to the people. Each of the Prime Ministers in their separate ways is unconvincing, although that might be a little bit unfair to Harold Holt. We see tensions between the coalition partners. I think, of course, of the tension between Malcolm Turnbull and Barnaby Joyce and the somewhat fraught mm. relationship we see in more recent times between the Liberal uh, and National parties. Um, we see, I think, a lot of policy confusion within the Liberal Party about its core beliefs and its core policies. Uh, and I think we see a loss of confidence on the part of the public uh, towards of these governments, both governments in that period and governments in the current period. So while there are obvious <coughs> significant differences, as Mr Howard's pointed out, I nonetheless think that there are some striking parallels which do offer insights. Okay, we are out of time, but we are going to call on uh, my friend and colleague, uh, John Nethercote. Uh, I don't know of anyone who knows the history of the Liberal Party better, perhaps John Howard, <laughs> than John Nethercote. John Nethercote. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, I'm delighted to have the uh, most agreeable task of proposing a vote of thanks for this most excellent session. We've been exceedingly lucky. On the one hand, we've had uh, a journalist of great distinction. He not only enlivens our week uh, three or four times uh, each week, <laughs> but for more than 40 years, he's provided us with an incomparable annals of Australian politics uh, in that era. Uh, we've got uh, one of the great statesmen of the democracy who not only has proved himself in the highest offices of government, but he's given us an exemplary autobiography and an equally excellent political history uh, of the Menzies period, which demonstrates, uh, in fact, a point that Sir Robert used to make, that those who've practised the business of government have something to shed uh, on telling the story of government. And then we have the new star in the firmament, Patrick Mullins. He's written a truly remarkable uh, book, uh, in traditional terms, it's a life and times, a life and times. A lot of biographies these days are, are a life, but they don't give us the times. <laughs> Patrick has given us both. Uh, he's also told us the story of an important figure, in a very important figure in Australia's post-war uh, politics. Um, it is true, uh, I think, in varying degrees, that Mr McMahon was uh, nasty, evil and devious. Um, if you're a scholar of Shakespeare, uh, you still study Iago. He was nasty, evil and devious. Uh, but some of the greatest scholars of Shakespeare will tell you that he was one of Shakespeare's characters of inexhaustible interest. I'm not going to go so far with Sir William <laughs> McMahon. But I just underline the point that uh, the fact that you're want, want, wanting in terms of morality 
virtue and integrity doesn't mean that you shouldn't be studied. <laughs> Patrick has also provided us with a path-breaking biography. Uh, again, those of you who know your caro, the four volumes of the years of Lyndon Johnson, the either the greatest work of biography in the English-speaking language in the 20th century or the joint uh, winner of that award along with Skidelsky on Keynes. Patrick has, knows the techniques, the methodologies of these new contemporary biographies in a way that most other practitioners of contemporary biography and I, I, of course, exclude the people who just do campaign biographies, Patrick has brought both the skills of traditional biography and the illuminations of new methodologies of which Robert Caro is a very great exemplar. What a wonderful evening it's been, these three uh, great figures uh, talking to us about an important era of our politics, and I'm sure that, like me, you want to give them appropriate applause. Well, thank you. Outstanding. Thank you. thank you. John, thank you. And thank you, John Howard, Paul Kelly and Patrick Mullins. And thank all of you for being here. Our next event is here on Thursday night on the crisis of democracy. We hope to see you again and we hope you've enjoyed this evening. Thanks so much.